Amen. It is amazing to me on many levels as I've preached and read the scriptures for forever that I had really never noticed uh, the flow of the Gospel of Mark that I really hadn't paid attention. You know, we read these texts on Sunday morning, we read a little pericope, a little portion here, a little portion here, a little portion here, and we forget that sometimes with the flow of the author, there's a story they're trying to tell, there is a big picture, there's a sermon that they want to share. And Mark has one here. He has one here as weeks ago, four to six weeks ago if you were here, and if not, you can go back and watch the sermon online or you can read the text, but four to six weeks ago, Mark talked about the rich young man, and he keeps coming back to haunt us. I think that's what Mark intended. Let me just recap that for those who may not know the story or weren't here. There's a righteous and upright young man. He's very successful. He's a member of the local Rotary Club. He's the who's who. He's done very, very well. And he comes to Jesus and says, what will it take to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, keep the law. And he says, I've kept the law. I'm a good person. And Jesus looks at him and says, okay, believe that. One thing you lack. Give it all away and come follow me. And the young man doesn't try to negotiate. He doesn't try to work out a tax break. He doesn't do anything. He goes away, the text says, and he's very sad. Park that right here because there have been numerous scriptures that have been building on that until we get to this point. Because when when Mark tells us that story, Jesus is not talking about wealth. He's not talking about money. He's not talking about the accumulation of things. What that text raises up is what gets between us and God? What gets between us and others? Is it our ego? Is it our self-absorption? Is it our self-concern? It's probably an assortment of things, but Jesus is really asking that young man, what gets between you and what you're asking? And of course, since that Sunday when you read that scripture, I've had a lot of people come up to me to talk to me about the rich young man and giving it all away, and they say, well, preacher, Jesus didn't really mean that, did he? And being the good fundraiser that I am, no, he didn't really mean that. You know what, you know, and we make all those kinds of things. Don't take it literally, you know. And then Mark gives us the story of the widow. Mark gives us the story of the widow, and he throws cold water right in my face. Because that's precisely what she does. She gives away all she has. And in the midst of all these other gifts, these large gifts, the clanging of the offering, all the big stuff going on that catches our eyes and we love to see and and write, about um, what catches Jesus' eye is this widow. In my mind's eye, she's like the Syrian refugee woman on the front of your bulletin. That's how she looks to me. And she throws in two coins. They look like this. This is a widow's mite. It's been made into a necklace, but this is a widow's mite. It was worth about a penny then, right? It was worth about a penny then. The irony of it is, if you wanted to buy one of these, you were in Israel today, you would probably pay $5 or $10. So there's been good appreciation in the widow's might. But it was uh, two cents. And we might say that's not much. It would be worth probably about $2 today in real-time dollars. But two mites would have bought for her enough barley, raw barley, to make bread for five days. And in a culture, in a society where people didn't live, it wasn't like everybody was middle class or this or that. It was just the very rich and then degrees of poverty. And widows were at the bottom of the food chain. 
five days worth of bread in a society where people are worried about the next meal, not let alone the next day's meal, is pretty incredible. And it says a ton to me. When I put it into that context, it says a ton to me about this woman's spirit. Her ability to trust and to love and to care. And what motivated her was, was somehow that generous spirit that was just so giving. You know, Jesus talks more about money than heaven or hell. Did you know that? 11 out of 29 parables are about money. And one out of every seven passages in Luke is about it. So, so Jesus constantly is talking about this element that keeps us going in our lives. But Jesus never says it's wrong or bad. Jesus just says that it determines our character. What we protect, what we fear, what we shield, what we use in our lives. The excuses we might make in having it. And if anybody had a reason not to be generous of spirit, this woman did, this widow did. Let, let's just take a look at her situation. You know, she had reason to be concerned about her finances. As I said, widows were at the bottom of the food chain. Women alone in this culture were nothing, very little. Women had their identity by the spouse they married. You know, that's why there are laws that if a, a husband dies, somebody's got to marry her, a brother, or somebody's got to marry her because she has nothing. And if there's no one out there to take care of her, the oldest son inherits anything that her former spouse had. This text doesn't give us any indication that there was anyone taking care of her. And there was no Medicaid, there was no Medicare, there was no Social Security, there was no welfare. There was nothing for this person to turn to. She was on her own as far as I can tell. It can be very tough. You know, when we see the kind of behavior, you know, even if a, a, an elder son was supposed to get some inheritance and take care of her, we see behavior today where mom or dad are put into an, uh, a nursing home and just forgotten. I mean, we know that today. Just because they're supposed to doesn't mean they will. Right? Bottom line... This is a tricky deal for her to do. Who's going to take care of her? Who is taking care of her? And yet that trust does not inhibit her from doing what she feels called to, to do. So you have an emotional, or a, a, economic, excuse me, you have an economic side to this. Then you have an emotional side. You know, when someone close to you passes or dies, we have an emotional reaction. We've all known somebody who's gone through death, lost a loved one, become very bitter. In the stages of grief, you know, it's not uncommon for a spouse who's lost a spouse to be mad at the spouse for dying. Why did you do this to me? Why did you leave me alone? Why didn't you take better care of yourself? Why didn't you exercise? Why did you eat all that pasta? Bacon. Bacon. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Why did you do that? Why didn't you buy a bigger life insurance policy? But you can't get mad at your spouse. That would be wrong. So you get mad at God. Because that's God's job, and God's out there, and God's not going to do anything to you. So you get mad at God. And if you're angry with God, you stop praying, you stop going to church, and you withhold your giving. This woman didn't do that either. So she rose above the economic plight that she might have had. She, she triumphed over the emotional anger or loss that she might have suffered. We begin to see her character. And then again, she may have just been a generous person as well. You know, we've all known people who are just not generous. They're just not very giving to begin with. I remember the story of a church doing a financial capital drive, and if you've ever done a capital campaign in a church, you know, you go visit people, you ask for a specific amount of money because you believe that they might be capable of giving it, and in this church they did that. They went to folks and talked to them, and this one gentleman said, well, thank you for all your investigation, but you know what? You just may not know that I have a mother that's in a nursing home. And she has no means to provide for her. 
And they said, wow, we didn't know that. And they said, I have a brother who worked for 30 years for a corporation, and then he decided to up and leave his wife and five children, and there's nobody to provide for her. And they go, wow, we didn't know that either. And he said, besides that, I have a son who is unemployed, and, and he hasn't been able to find a job. And I'll bet you didn't discover that in your research. And they were very embarrassed, and they said, we are very sorry. And he says, well, let me tell you something. I've never given a penny to any of those people, so why should I give a penny to you? The widow could have been fearful, economic reasons, practical reasons, and just plain personal selfishness. But she wasn't any of these things. We have in this very small vignette, I think, one of the purest souls in the Bible. She truly lived out what the Apostle Paul called us to do, is give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances, not merely those that are obviously great, but even in times, and maybe most of all, in times that are challenging. Because it is that spirit that motivates us, it drives us, it frees us, it, 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 it enables us to rise above our own selves. It gives us purpose, and it gives us vision, and it gives, gives us a good, common spirit that makes, just makes the world better. I suspect this woman was the first person to take meals to somebody else who was sick and needy. I'll bet if she had five loaves of bread, she took one out to somebody every day if she could. I bet that this woman never spoke poorly of other people. I'll bet when other people gossiped, she either walked away or stopped it right then and there. I'm willing to bet that this woman looked for good in everyone and everything. I'm willing to bet that this widow had a lot of friends. I'm willing to bet she didn't worry, have to worry about being cared for because she had cared for so many others that that love just came back. I suspect she found purpose and meaning in every day of her life, regardless of what it brought. And who among us doesn't want that? Seriously. Who among us doesn't want that? This is the time of year that most churches do annual stewardship drives. Uh, we do ours in the winter months. But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't always be thinking about the blessings that we have and what we do with them and what that says about us and what we live for and so forth. And each of us can find one of these reasons to hold tight. Emotions, economics, whatever, we can hold tight to the blessings God has shared with us. But when we do that, you know, it's like holding a grudge or being angry. When you, when you, when you do that, you just seal your soul off. Yeah, I mean, you almost suffocate yourself. You can just kind of... And we miss the joy of participating and sharing the ministry that God calls us to do. I have to tell you, I am very excited about what God has and is accomplishing through this church. When I look at all the mission programs that we do, I am extremely humbled. I am extremely humbled by all that you do and what you try to do. And it fills my spirit to see the many ways that we care, not just for our own, but for the unknown. And I not only wish to see that continue, I wish to see that grow. I think that's what the world needs to see. Too many people, we just got the survey out again this week about religion in the United States, and it continues to decline. Seven to eight percent from a few years ago continues to decline. And I think the witness that we bear is that we are not a club, and we don't just live for ourselves, but we're living for others. We're living the commandment to love God and to love neighbor in all circumstances. I wish to see our church continue to do this, but it can't if we are not, like this widow, generous in our love of God through our support. My former colleague, uh, Otis Young, 
Um, he's deceased now, but Otis used to stand in front of his congregation once a year, and he used to say to them, I got good news and I got bad news for you. The good news is that we have among us all the resources we need to perform the ministry God calls us to do. We got it. The bad news is you got to give it. And maybe that's not such bad news, you know? This is the season of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, not thanks pretending. And there's a huge difference. Thanks pretending. Because even if you write a check, that doesn't absolve you from getting your hands dirty. You know, in American culture, it's almost too easy to write the check and walk away. There is that commitment of mind, body, soul. Because true giving, as this widow did, is sacrificial living. It is a fine art of the soul. It's as magnificent as a beautiful Picasso or a Dolly or any painting or artwork you can think of. And if that is true, if this is true, what I'm telling you is true, then the widow's story is a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece of humanity. It is a work of art that I could only hope to mimic, perhaps achieve, and if I'm very, very lucky and work hard, <laughs> a work of art that maybe will be me that I can own. Amen.